Welcome back to Educator.com. Um, today we're going to be covering some very important parts of uh, C++, particularly object-oriented programming. Uh, without object-oriented programming, you might as well use C. Okay, so far we've been dealing with procedural programming with C++, which it does just as well as any other language is procedural. Uh, but the strength of using C++ instead of C is object-oriented programming. It's a somewhat different way of looking at design, programming, etc. for putting your applications together. Your data and structures are gathered into objects, which are defined into classes of objects, and they are isolated as much as possible from other objects. We emphasize important concepts. These particular concepts are abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Some of this we've already seen in procedural programming, but we emphasize it more in object-oriented programming. C++ gives you multiple inheritance. Some other languages don't, some other languages do. But basically it means an object can inherit, you know, in object-oriented programming, everything has a class which you inherit from other classes. But in C++, you can inherit from more than one parent class. So with multiple inheritance, it allows for various things. You can use different parts from, from different things, but you also have to be worried about the diamond pro problem, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and we're going to talk about construction and destruction of objects, which allocate and deallocate memory on it when they're necessary. Well, let's talk about a little of some concepts. Historically, you, you, what you've done is, is procedural programming, uh, which means basically your programming follows a procedure. And a procedure is a similar to an algorithm, except that you, you, the only way you know for sure that things work properly is to test it. An algorithm technically is something you know is going to do a certain thing. A procedure is an algorithm that runs a certain way, and you are not 100% assured that it will go a certain way. Uh, where the, the, the classical mathematical um, terminology is that it will end. You, you, you run it, and it will actually come to a conclusion. Um, Object-oriented line is, is, is similar to procedure, except for now, instead of just merely having procedures, we now also have objects that simulate objects in the real world. And again, we emphasize important concepts, concepts that you can do in procedural programming, but in object-oriented, they're, they're emphasized abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. And I want to reiterate these because these are very important concepts that will be used in object-oriented programming. So again, the data structures are gathered into an object. An object is part of a class of objects, and then we'll talk about some of these other parameters in, in the next slides. I mean, let's get some terminology out of the way. An object is a collection of related data, which are called attributes and functions that operate on that explicit data in that object, and they're called methods. And it represents something in the real world. Car is an object. And in your car object, you might have your, your velocity, your location, um, how many passengers are in the car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a class defines the object attributes. And it can inherit from superclasses, or you can derive from a superclass into a subclass. An instance is an actual object with actual data, as opposed to just um, generically talking about objects or in classes and all this stuff. If you actually have an object instance, that is actually some code in your application that's actually running. For example, let's say we have a class called horse, which you know, describes his weight, his age, when he was born, um, his owner, etc., etc. And we use that as a type and declare an object called Mr. Ed. The variable Mr. Ed is an instance of the class horse. Now, a derived class or subclass is the inheritor, it inherits from the superclass. The base class or superclass is the inheritee, he's the one who is inherited from. Like a horse may inherit many attributes from a superclass called animal or racing animal. Now, abstraction. Abstraction defines just the essential characteristics of the object or class of objects, particularly those that are needed for the task at hand. It would emphasize essential. You don't necessarily want to have all possible data because that'll make your application too large. So you just pull out, abstract the ones that you need. For example, banking data will need the customer name, their address, the type of account, the date of the last deposit, etc., etc., etc. The customer's favorite team, not so important. We can leave it out of our banking application. We may want to use it in our sports betting application. But for this application, or whatever application you're working on, you have to analyze your situation and determine what data are you going to abstract into your system. And we also need to emphasize the characteristics that are different from one class of objects from another class. For example, we may have an employee data in an object, which has a name, a wage. We have a separate um, object called company, which also has a name. It also has an annual profit. Now, should these two particular objects have the same parent class? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on your analysis. Should it be the same class? Because after all, wage is a dollar sign. Annual profit is a dollar sign. Well... You probably don't want to make them the same object. For one thing, your methods that will be applied against this data will be different. Yes, you need to enter the, the name. You need to print out the name. But your wage, you, the employee pays taxes on their wages differently than a company pays taxes on their annual profit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So because these, in the real world, they're certainly distinct objects. And they're, they're definitely different from each other. So in our application, we want to abstract them into two different objects in our application also. 
Now we have encapsulation. This is where we take the data and compartmentalize all the characteristics of the abstraction into our object. We isolate the characteristics from other classes and create modularity. So the data and the methods will govern the state of an object. The object is just a car object. Your current speed is a variable. Uh, so that's, that's one of the attributes, the current speed. Your, your state of your car object is that your speed is 25 miles per hour. And then you'll have a method that says, well, we need to change that. We need to apply acceleration to increase that speed to a new state. Private data is one of the values of object-oriented is to declare data as private, to really increase your modularity, to prevent other people from dicking around inside your object and doing things you're not allowed to do. So you keep it away from prying eyes and do not have a need to know. But you can give your, your callers to your object a public method that allows controlled access. So, so yes, you can change the speed of this car, but you have to call one of the object methods. So you can't just say, well, speed equals zero. Well, two seconds ago, it was 25 miles an hour. You can't go from 25 miles an hour to zero. What you can do is call the brake method, for example. And then based on how much braking force you apply, you can start to slow your speed down because the object which is running the car is in control, not just the rest of the application. Now, protected data is accessible to the inherited classes. So you may, one, one of the things about object-oriented is when you design a system and you have an object, you generally will intend for that object to be inherited. Um, and if you intend for it to be inherited, some of the data may need to be protected so that the classes that inherit from that class have access to that data. Uh, you can't just randomly just say, oh, here's a good object, let's just start inheriting from it. Well, it's generally not a good idea. You should design it for inheritance if it's going to be inherited, if you intend to inherit from it. And some classes or methods can be flagged as a friend, so it doesn't even need to be inherited. These particular objects, these particular classes, methods, we're going to say, well, we're going to say that's a friend of our object, so that, that friend we will trust. And now, inheritance. Like, you may hear a lot about inheritance dealing with object-oriented programming. It's, it's a very um, valuable part, and it's one of the things that really dis distinguishes away from procedural programming. So it's a relationship between the object classes. In particular, it's sometimes called an is-a relationship. An object is a particular special kind of some other object. A car is a vehicle. So, we can, for example, we have cars, ships, airplanes, they're all different kinds of vehicles. So your vehicle class, for, to design, define a vehicle object, may have its position, you know, in space, X, Y, Z, etc., its current speed, its acceleration, how much it weighs, and whatever other information is required for whatever your application is. And a ship is a vehicle, but it has additional attributes. In particular, it has a certain amount of buoyancy, which allows it to float a certain height in the water. An airplane is a vehicle. So a ship and airplane would inherit from the vehicle class, but the airplane adds special things for an airplane, such as has a certain altitude, it flies up into the air. And you might even want to go further. Ship has buoyancy, you might have another one called submarine, which inherits from ship. It can have negative buoyancy, it sinks under the water. And then finally, polymorphism. That's the ability for methods and functions to take on different behaviors depending on the object. And we've seen a little bit of this in terms of function calls. In particular, we have, uh, you can have um, different parameters, or you will see this in a we have seen this. Um, so get line in particular, if you've got just two parameters, that means you have a character string and an integer for the limit. Now we have that. If we add an additional parameter, now that's a slightly different definition for get line. Now we have a different definition for the delimiter. Now, operator overloading, you've seen that even in procedural languages, where you've got A plus B, the plus operator does something different based on what the A and B objects are. In other procedural languages, if, it's an if A and B are integers, the plus will do integer addition. If they're both double or floating point, the plus will do floating point arithmetic, to do floating point um, addition, which is slightly different. It could be different subroutines than the integer arithmetic. Um, in C++ and other languages, you could have an integer plus or a string. If, you have, if A is a string and B is a string, it's totally different than 7 plus 8. Now you have this string and that string, and they're appended to each other. Now, methods inherited from another object can be overwritten and customized to the new object. Your brake method could be in a base class vehicle. But what brake does, in terms of polymorphism, if you have airplane is a vehicle, you've got air brakes. The flaps on the outside of the wings come down to slow the airplane down. A car, you have your drum brakes or disc brakes on the wheels to slow the automobile down. And a ship may not have brakes at all, so you call the brake method and just send an error. So, no, we don't have brakes on the ship. We have to actually run the engine in reverse in order to slow it down, which is a totally different concept than actual braking. Now, a quick thing on is a versus has a. Is a will be inheritance. You have a class which is a some other class, or an object is a some other object. So the car can inherit the attributes and behavior from its superclass because it's a certain kind of that superclass. So a car is a vehicle. Well, suppose we have a couple other classes. We have a car class and a tire class. Well, is a car is a car a type of tire? No, is a tire a type of car? No. But a car has a tire. In particular, it has four tires plus a spare. This is a has a relationship. And it's basically, it's just like we've seen structures where you can have your integers and your floats and your other member functions of the structure. You can also have other classes as a member of the class. So an ob object motorcycle 
is a vehicle. It also has a tire, in particular it has two tires. It doesn't have a spare. Now, multiple inheritance. Uh, different languages support multiple inheritance. Um, some of them support it in different ways, some of them don't support it at all. C++ supports it. So a derived class can inherit from more than one superclass. And the, the one example is you might see, in, if you look in the C++ standard directory, there's an IOS class for IO streams. And it has a couple, there's a output stream and an input stream that both derive from the IOS. But, and then from there, you have an IO stream. And that's where you get input and output to a stream. Um, if you have an IO stream object, if you're going to use write, it will use the input stream. Or it will use the output stream, excuse me. If you do read, it will use the input stream. So in this particular example, we have vehicle describes the general attributes of your vehicles. A licensable object describes the general um, attributes of an item that requires some legal registration. So a car has to get a license number, has to get a license plate put on the front. So a car is a vehicle, and it is a licensable. An off-road bank, an off-road bank, the little motorcycles you see them running up in the, in the dirt and hills and such, it is a vehicle, but it does not need a license. You just, as long as you not keep it off the public roads, it doesn't need a license. Whereas a pistol is licensable, depending on your jurisdiction. You have to get take it to the police station, have it registered. They put down a number. They want to know who owns this pistol in case it gets stolen, used in a crime. But obviously, it's not a vehicle. So be careful with your design. Be on, on the lookout for overlap because now pistol and car are not likely to have an overlap. But you will find occasions where there may be some overlap. For example, the input stream may have an open, output stream may have an open. So if you use an open here, you may have to overwrite that open in order to keep confusion from the inherited open. Um, if you're going to open a file for input and output, if you're going to open, a, if you're going to have an IO stream and open it just for output, then you can use a namespace operator and specify that you want to use the output stream open to open a file strictly for output. And I illustrated the diamond problem right here, where you have one class with two subclasses, which are then inherited multiply into a, another class. And that can cause you problems. It doesn't necessarily have to cause problems, but make sure your, your names for your different methods and attributes don't overlap as much as you can. Now, one thing about C++, uh, their, their classes each have constructors and destructors. So an object has a constructor that will allocate the memory. So a, a, an object will have a certain amount of memory. You define, okay, we have an integer inside our object, we've got a string, and we have maybe a float for something else. Well, all this requires a certain amount of memory, and the compiler has to say, okay, here's memory for this instance of that object. But there will also be occasions where you need to destroy that. I don't need it anymore. I want to reuse that memory for something else. So it will deallocate that. Now, if you as a programmer don't provide a constructor and a destructor, the compiler will create defaults, because it needs to at least get the memory for your object and then take it away. The constructor is automatically called when a new instance is called, either by ex explicitly or by declaration. By explicitly, it's like you have an object equals a new object. So you're saying, give me some memory for a car, and I'm going to put that and have a pointer to that allocated memory. And then when you're finished with it, please delete it. Um, you can also do it by declaration. You, you don't have to get a new object. You can have, for example, you can have a while loop, whatever your expression is, and then open your curly braces, and then just declare your car. And this will call the constructor, this will call the default constructor, build a car, give you an instance C, you can point to that memory, and then you can use the car for whatever you're going to use it for. And then at the end of your while loop, now this, this car now goes out of scope. The compiler will automatically call the destructor for that particular instance. And of course, you can overload it with different parameters. You can have, when you create a new car, you may want to put in the name of the car. Let's call it 42, what the heck. The guy who owns the car, me. Whatever other data goes in there. So you, now you've got as many... Um, different constructors overloaded as constructors as necessary with whatever parameters you need to build or initialize the construct the particular object however you need to, to, to build it but there will only be one destructor um, so basically you had now have an object you built it however you need to build it you modify it however you're going to modify it when it's time to go off it goes but you may need to write a destructor for example if you if inside your constructor inside your object you allocated new memory. It says, okay, one of my, I've got a tire object inside my car, and so I need to allocate memory. Give me a new tire. Give me a new tire. You do that four times. i got four tires. And in your destructor, so, well, now I have to give the tire memory back when the car object is destroyed. So you need to destroy the tires. And the destructor is automatically called, if you, if you declare it inside a scope, the destructor is automatically called when you leave the scope. Otherwise, if you do use a new operator, then you need to call the delete operator, and that will call the destructor. Ah, now, this is my kind of inheritance. 
you know, all you need is a, is a rich uncle money bags. But I don't have a rich uncle money bags. But that's today's class for educator.com. I will see you next time.